Greetings everyone and welcome back to the bench. Today on the bench is the TDA 7264 stereo amplifier IC. And the nice thing about this, it can deliver a clean 20 watts per channel. It doesn't look like it would do that. It just has eight pins and it's just one chip. So we'll put this thing through its paces and see what it can do. The nice thing about it, it has the standard spacing single inline pins type package so it's easy to use on a perf board a lot of those ICs have the staggered type pin array and you know they just don't fit on a socket board you'd have to have a board made up for it and I think quite a few people with the do-it-yourself spirit would like this because like I say it's easy to use on a perf board and as we shall see it doesn't require a lot of external parts so it's easy to put together a stereo amplifier using just one chip and not a lot of extra components. So what I'm going to do today is test this chip out. We'll do the power measurements, distortion measurements. But first, I need to take a look at the data sheet. There's a few things I need to cover. Then I'll come up with a schematic, a layout, and then I'll put it together on a perf board. Okay, here's the data sheet. They say it's a 25 by 25 watt stereo amplifier with mute and standby. Of course, they're using the silly 10% distortion for that. I want to see what its power is before it gets into clipping. See what its honest power is, as I call it. Distortion free. Um, you can read this stuff if you want. Now here's the circuit. Here's why it doesn't require a lot of components. Now here's the output. The input just has these capacitors. Ignore this mute circuit. This is for interfacing it with the microcontroller. And most of you are probably just going to build a standalone amplifier. So I'm going to come up with a circuit that will negate the use of these extra components. You still need some components, but it, you won't need a transistor and resistors and stuff like that. But the reason this doesn't have a lot of parts, the negative feedback is internal, as is the input bias resistors. All internal inside the chip, so you don't have to worry about those parts externally. However, that means you cannot set the gain of the amplifier However, the gain is set to a value that you would normally use in, with such an amplifier, so it's you know, not a big deal. Uh, these are the pinouts. Of course, you'd want to download this data sheet if you'd want to build the amplifier. Um, the maximum DC supply voltage is plus minus 25 volts. That means it requires a dual supply or bipolar type DC supply and uh, output peak current 4.5 amps and that should be plenty for this amplifier's use with that supply voltage of course you wouldn't run the amplifier at its maximum you'd run it at uh, depending on your load at a smaller voltage more electrical specifications they tell you the power at different distortion levels. And you see here at 1% at uh, different supply voltages and different load impedances. You should be able to get a decent power, but again, I'm going to check it without any uh, oh, Snickers. <laughs> Look what you did. <laughs> it's not a good time, Snickers. Snickers wants to get into the video and wrecking my setup here. Okay. More specifications. And we get into the curves. Uh, here is the frequency response. And you notice at 20 hertz, it's down not quite 0.5 dB. The reason for that is the value of the input capacitor they chose to use. I think it was one microfarads. If you consider that an issue, I would use a larger one like a 2.2. However, 
your hearing and virtually any speaker is not going to be nearly that flat down to that frequency level. To me, it doesn't make sense to use a larger capacitor, but if you're going for a more flatter curve, I guess you could, you know, just to be technically better. And it's about a half a dB down at 100 kilohertz. And some people say, why do you need such bandwidth? And I've gone through that in other videos. It all has to do with getting low distortion at higher audio frequencies. In other words, in the audio band, it has to have enough loop gain for the negative feedback to do its job. So that's the reason why amplifiers have seemingly ridiculous extended frequency responses. So that's all I'll say on that. Distortion, not too bad. The all-important 1 kilohertz line here at your normal listening levels, which would be, you know, in the low wattage area, it's very low, dipping down to 0.1. I, I'm sorry, this is the 1 kilohertz line. It's actually dipping down well below 0.1. And then it starts to hit clipping where it goes above 0.1. So, yeah, it's should have pretty good sound quality that's the uh, 15 kilohertz line above there and you know solid state amps always going to have some more distortion at higher frequencies and it's not bad there either this here discusses the mute and standby mode they do it all with one pin so they use different voltages to set the mute standby and play modes and what I've done is I made a better diagram that's a little easier to understand. And I'll show you that next. Well, Snickers parked himself on the chair right here. I had to give him a little bit of room. So here is how the mute circuit works. The mute and standby and play mode. You have to set the pin 4 voltage to a certain level to make the amplifier run in different modes. So when you set the mute pin between the supply voltage positive and the supply voltage positive minus 2.5 volts, it's in standby. That means the internal bias of the amplifier is turned off, so it's not drawing a lot of current. And they use that with a lot of modern electronics to reduce the power consumption. To put it into mute mode, you have to have the pin between the supply voltage minus 2.5 and the supply voltage minus 6 volts. So mute mode just means it doesn't put out any sound but the internal bias currents are operating inside the chip. To put the amplifier into play mode you have to put the supply voltage or I'm sorry the mute pin at supply voltage minus 6 volts to supply voltage minus 10 volts and you'll get output from the amplifier. And you don't want to run it at any voltage less because it could put the amplifier in an odd state. In other words, if you just try to ground that pin, I've seen some chips where they draw heavy current and it could damage the amplifier IC if you do that. Now most people building an amplifier, it's going to be standalone you know, if they want to turn it on, they'll just hit the power. So, I have devised the basic circuit here using a Zener diode to set the voltage to be in between this range. So, I'm using a 7.5 volt Zener diode. Of course, it's hooked up reverse bias for the Zener effect to work. And there's a 10K resistor which allows bias current to flow. I have a capacitor across the Zener diode which, depending on the value of the capacitor, it has a small time constant which holds the amplifier off for a few milliseconds. You don't want the speakers to make a pop sound when you're turning the amplifier on, so that's the reason for that. One more thing I almost forgot to say is you could just use a resistor voltage divider, but this is in effect these voltages regardless of the uh, power supply voltage that you use. So if you use it with a power supply voltage 
and say the amplifier draws heavy current, you're playing music loud through forum speakers, it pulls the voltage down, it could shift the voltage on that pin into another state. That's why I recommend the Zener diode because it's always going to have that voltage at supply voltage minus 7.5 volts which is right here in the play region. And we all love to play, right? Here is the schematic diagram. It's a little more complex than the one on the data sheet. They always make the data sheets look as simple as possible. They don't put all the parts I think that are really recommended with an audio amplifier. For example, I have the low pass filter on the inputs that keep the uh, higher frequencies out such as RF and it can also prevent the amplifier from picking the signal up from its own output say this inputs disconnected and the impedance of the input makes the amplifier quite sensitive and it can pick up its own output and oscillate and the oscillation will be at a high frequency and it can burn out the output Zobel network or uh, cause the amplifier to run very hot, damage tweeters. So I strongly encourage any audio amplifier to have the uh, low pass filter on the inputs. I also have electrolytic capacitor like 220 microfarads along with a film or a ceramic bypass capacitor on both supply rails. The data sheet shows a 1000 microfarad but you can use a lower value considering that you have large value capacitors on your power supply. And last but not least is the little circuit I just covered earlier that handles the mute and standby pin function to hold the amplifier into play mode. Here's the perf board layout of the amplifier I come up with. It's looking at the component side down through the board to the traces. And yeah, it's kind of messy to read here but just bear with me. I have the capacitor filter banks here with the film caps. Actually I'm using ceramic caps as the bypass or the small value bypass capacitors and those are placed very close to the chip. All the power grounds and the outputs are returned to this side of the capacitor bank and on this side is the small signal which goes to the ground pin on the amplifier which is just there because of the input bias resistor and a negative feedback needs that ground reference point and another line comes off here for the input grounds so I believe I have a very good layout of the amplifier to give us the minimum amount of distortion and for the amplifier to be as stable as possible Okay, so I'll build this circuit out and be right back. And here it is. Not much to it. It all fits on this little perf board here. You can see I followed it pretty much as close as I could. I actually uh, turned this capacitor sideways because of this hole here. I didn't have a lot of room. I ran the wires through the holes here to act as strain reliefs because as I test this thing, I'm going to be moving it around, and I don't want the wires to weaken and break off. I tied these down here. I have to mount this to a heat sink. If you decide to build this circuit and mount it to a heat sink, make sure you use a mica washer because it has better thermal conductivity as opposed to those rubber-like seal pads that don't transfer heat as well. And this is a stereo IC, of course, and you know, 20 watts per channel, it's going to have to dissipate quite a bit of heat. So you want to get as much heat out of the chip as you can. Okay, great. Let's hook this thing up. I'll get it on a heat sink, and I'll start the test. Of course, I'll give a little music sample at the beginning. Oh yeah, here is the bottom of the circuit. I just use copper wire to act as traces. Okay, I have the amplifier hooked up. Got the heat sink on there. I'm not using an isolator here just for this test. 
but keep in mind that the negative supply voltage appears on this tab and of course now will appear on the heat sink. Have the uh, power supply hooked up to the capacitor bank. Even though I'm using a regulated supply I found that I do get a little bit better output measurements when I use the capacitor bank close to the amplifier here. So I have the power supply all hooked up ready to go preamp music source I can't find my other music player that has most of my audio test files and stuff on there so I'll just have to do what I can do okay for now I will uh, play a music sample let's see here let's turn the supply off and on pretty quiet I don't hear any pops or anything okay I had to stop and look for my other player because this one doesn't have any royalty free music and plus I have my uh, audio test files on this one really need to get a newer player Sony has a newer model out that's supposed to be pretty good now between these two I still can't put all my files on there even compressed I have a pretty big music collection you know that's why I do all this stuff with amplifiers because I like to listen to music and uh, yeah these cannot contain it all This is uh, non-existent. Even with my ear, I can barely hear the slightest thing with my ear right on the tweeter. So noise and hiss is very well controlled in this amplifier. I guess this will be the first use of my new oscilloscope. Never in my life when I first started my channel that I would think that somebody would just send me an oscilloscope like this <laughs> I'm just amazed at the generosity of people I see it a lot on different channels people supporting creators but yeah I do appreciate that okay here I'm not sure why this is offset you know, I uh, centered it out it's AC coupled, even with the amplifier turned off. Now I'll have to look into that. But anyway, go ahead and test this thing. Okay, there's clipping. That's very nice symmetrical clipping. I don't see any weird oscillations or anything going on at clipping. We are both channels driven, 4 ohm loads. Make sure they're both getting hot. Yep. I'm testing at plus and minus 12 volts right now. I'll do other voltages. But just for this, I'll test. And well, let's turn out the clipping and get a voltage. And uh, they put the text so small on these new scopes 6.83 it looks like let me see what that is when I grab my calculator here 6.83 squared divided by 4 getting 11.66 watts so actually uh, that's doing pretty well I'd expect around 12 watts. Okay, so now I'm going to test it at plus and minus 16 volts power supply, which is probably the maximum I would recommend with 4 ohm loads. The resolution of the scope makes it a lot easier to see when you're out of clipping. It's not as granular as my old scope. 9.13 volts. 20.8 watts. Very good. 
Okay, so what I'll do now is I'll take a bunch of more measurements off camera and I'll come back with the results. I'll report the power measurements at the end of the video, but now we'll do a frequency response sweep and we'll start with the 10 to 100 hertz sweep. It's set up that the peaks of the waveform should touch the bottom graticule here in the top. So here we go. We're at 20 hertz, so we're pretty much there. Like I said, with the input capacitor value they're using, it's going to be a little bit less. Also with these sweeps, keep in mind that my music player, the, it does breathe a little bit. I say that in every video, but it's just one little thing with this music player. And we're there at 100 hertz and it just recycles. Next is the 20 to 20 kilohertz sweep. You can see it's going off screen a little bit due to the breathing of my music player, the way it, the frequency response kind of swells and shrinks. But, you know, it's going to be pretty much flat through the frequency range. And done! Uh, music player rolls off ever so slightly at the end there, but it's no surprise, you know, pretty much with any solid state amplifier that's not limited with some weird capacitor arrangement in its circuit, you're going to have pretty much perfectly flat frequency response. Okay, I'm back on the Rigel DS1052E oscilloscope because I haven't been able to set the FFT up yet correctly. There's Probably uh, just me learning how to do it, but anyway, we have the 1 kilohertz fundamental, the 4.5 1% pilot signal, and it's looking pretty flat, maybe a little blip of a second order harmonic there. So the amplifier itself looks pretty clean. Okay, this is distortion at 10 kilohertz and uh, it's pretty much noise floor, maybe a little blip here. Uh, sometimes it could be generated from the oscilloscope, but uh, it's a pretty clean amplifier so far. And finally, we're looking at the 20 hertz waveform. Of course, it's slow updating because the low frequency requires uh, more data points to get information, so yeah, it's pretty flat. Looks really clean there. It kind of bumps up sometimes because the file I'm playing cycles around. It has to reset. Okay, so what I'm running now is a step response test where I put a 10 kilohertz waveform, a square wave actually, into the amplifier and seeing if there's any ringing or any odd things like oscillations going on. So just with a straight load resistor, it's a pretty nice waveform. So what I do now is near to the amplifier's output, I'll put a capacitor, a film capacitor, and see if it causes any ringing. And if you remember my tests with my JAT501 amplifier I built, you can see you know, if the amplifier is stable. Of course, this has no effect whatsoever. So let's try this um, 274. So that's a 0.27 microfarad. Now, to properly do this test, you have to test it a bunch of different voltage levels, supply voltages, different output loads, a bunch of different capacitances. Yeah, I can't really do that. Look at that. Wow, found some instability. The 0.27 cap made the amplifier go unstable. Uh, let's see what 
a one microfarad does. Yeah. Unstable. Let's try it at a different level, see what happens. Yeah, it just oscillates. You know, I'm using a very good layout, you know, the circuit layout, but the amplifier does oscillate. Sometimes these chip amps, you know, they're not the most stablest thing out there. Well, now this one, what's going on? See there, it's not oscillating much, but then it... Huh, this is kind of bizarre. Let me try that again. That's the one microfarad. That's a very tough load for any amplifier, but it's really breaking out into oscillation. This is what I'm getting with the point two seven now. Why is it oscillating? This is what I would expect to see, a little bit of ringing. Let's crank this up a bit. You can see that a little clearer. See, I'm seeing... This is what I would expect to see. Some ringing, but not really breaking out into oscillation. Let me try the one microfarad again. <laughs> it just goes wild there. Let's turn that down. Let's turn that up, actually. And you can see 125 kilohertz. Ooh, the amp draws a lot of current. But it didn't blow up. I guess its protection circuit saves it. Let me try the 0.27 again. See, now it, that one was oscillating too, but now it's just doing that. That's kind of strange. Well, it's really rare that the amplifier would see a one microfarad capacitor directly across its outputs without some sort of series resistance. So yeah, that is a tough load, but it, also, it's kind of disappointing to see it oscillate. Yeah, here's the point two seven again. It's it's not breaking out into any oscillation. Oh, there, see it. Uh, let me hold it on there a little bit. Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on. The connection's fine. There's, we don't have a connection issue. Just sometimes it does. Sometimes it just rings. Okay, here's the power output measurements. This column is the supply voltages showing the plus and minus rail voltage. This is the 4 ohm measurements and 8 ohm measurements. I measured every 2 volts, but I, if you notice here, I forgot to put 14 volts in, but you can guesstimate about what value that would be. Went ahead and measured the, the amplifier at 4 ohm loads at plus minus 18 volts and I got a pretty reasonable 26.3 watts and of course with 8 ohm loads you can take it a lot higher because the current will be a lot less and we nearly hit 29 volts so that was pretty good at 18 volts with the 4 ohm load the amplifier was drawing 2.27 amps but keep in mind that these are both channels driven with all these tests. Uh, let's see. Quiescent current with the amplifier warmed up at uh, plus or minus 16 volts is 120 milliamps. The minimum operating voltage before the amplifier shut down was plus or minus 7 volts. So a pretty neat little amp you might want to build. Everything looked good, except for that step response test, but I really don't think you'd have any problems with 
stability. In normal use, you would never subject the amplifier to that kind of capacitance on its output. The amplifier that I built, the JAT501, and the LM1875 was pretty much unconditionally stable with those types of capacitance on the output. Well, there you have it, the TDA7264 Stereo Amplifier IC. I would certainly give it a recommendation. Thanks for watching.